All right, last lesson, we, uh, we looked at uh, some of Nokia's problems at the beginning of the zeros or whatever the decade is called, <clears throat> the aughts. And at that time, Nokia was really focused on hardware. They had, I don't know, 20 or 30 different models. They had tried to get an operating system into their phone. It was called Symbian. And this operating system was kind of clunky. They were trying to start using, they had the cameras going a little bit. Um, they were trying to use touchscreen a little bit, but they also had those little pointer things. You had to use that little pencil thing. This is also before um, websites were, I think they'll call them, what's the word, optimized. They were optimized for mobile devices. So today, if you want to have a uh, if you want your website to be visible on all tablets and iPhones, etc., you have to change and you have to create a secondary format of your website. One that fits on a computer laptop screen and another one that is uh, set for uh, an iPhone screen. And you know that because you use the same site on both your phone and your laptop and it looks different. But that was a new idea, it was very expensive <coughs> to try to set up two or three different models of websites. So the websites that were working on Nokia's phones were still a little bit clunky, a little bit hard to read, and they had a change in management. And the focus of the management went away. Uh, they, they stayed with hardware and they didn't really focus on software. They also were number one. They were number one by a huge amount in market share. <clears throat> I showed you the chart last time. And so when you think about where they were at, they felt that the competition from Apple in particular would be a niche market, maybe even a luxury market because those uh, phones were, you know, much, the Nokia phones were cheap. And the uh, iPhone was quite expensive, maybe three or four times more expensive. So the features and benefits that came with the iPhone were not really apparent to Nokia. They didn't really see, okay, so great. It's only got one design. It's not that exciting for people. Yeah, the touch screen is better. Um, it turns out the operating system was actually easier to use. So, uh, but it reflected a, a difference in philosophy between the two companies. So let's look at part of what, I'll, I'll stop it at certain points. How did Nokia fail? Part three, the finale. Hi, Diego here, and welcome to the final episode of The Rise and Fall. Right there. That's that's that's. There's more. There must be 50 or 60 more versions. But right there, there's about 20 different versions of Nokia phones. None of which has a screen that you're really thrilled with. Nokia. It's been an amazing journey so far. We've traveled from the 1800s to the year 2006, looking at Nokia's history and how they rose to power. Thanks for joining me thus far. In today's final episode of the series, we'll be taking a look at how Nokia fell. The story of Nokia's decline starts badly but ends up terrible. As we'll soon see, the company succumbed to a wolf in sheep's clothing. Let's begin. In the mid-2000s, Nokia's N series was the flagship product line. The N95 was a case in point. It had all the makings of a modern smartphone, just the wrong type of human-machine interaction. The series received a generally positive reception until the industry was shaken in 2007. 
at the major place Nokia, arrived when Apple released the iPhone. It was a phone with a full touch interface, much like the LG product before it. But the difference with Apple's product and the secret to its success was the capacitive touchscreen display and desktop roots in its OS. Suddenly, the N95 didn't look so impressive anymore. And the very next year, the game was about to change again. Google released their first Android phone, and the famous battle of the smartphone OSs had begun. However, Alright, the battle of the smartphone OSs, operating systems. So, uh, keep in mind, Nokia has this one called Symbian, and then we have the rise of Android and the iOS, the Apple system, all at the same time. Nokia did actually respond with the old touchscreen 5800 Express Music phone. It was a commercial success and was largely praised for its supply stylus and the low price. But it was actually viewed negatively by critics for its poor software implementation. So great, here we have Nokia responding to Google and Apple, right? So where did it all go wrong? How did Nokia fall? Well, hold on to your hats, people, because what you're about to hear is a real employee inside information that you will not get anywhere else on YouTube. A special thanks to Wall Street Journal for this one. The first set of inside information we get is from former Vice President and Chief of Design at Nokia, Frank Nuovo. He was at this position during Nokia's glory days and resigned in 2006 when the management changed. This is Nuovo speaking. I look back and I think that Nokia was just a very big company that started to maintain its position more than innovate for new opportunities. He continues. All of Trying to maintain its position rather than innovate. The opportunities were in front of Nokia, and they were working on them. But the key word was a sense of urgency. There was a real sense of just saying, we'll get to that eventually. For example, Nokia had prototype 8-inch tablet computers years before the iPad even emerged. Okay, so we see that Nokia was a bit slow to move, but that couldn't really be all. Let's take a deeper look into Nokia's mindset. This is actually pretty incredible. Nokia's engineers stated that the iPhone was way too expensive to manufacture and only worked on 2G networks, primitive when compared to Nokia's 3G technology. They scoffed as the iPhone didn't even come close to passing Nokia's rigorous drop tests. It seems funny today, but it's almost understandable from Nokia's point of view back then. So they thought, okay, it's more durable. We're using a different system, 3G over 2G. But it was that way that you use the touchscreen. They still thought they had it going on. Despite this, the iPhone ended up selling like hotcakes. And by 2008, Nokia's executives realized that matching Apple's slick operating system amounted to their biggest challenge and their number one priority. So internally within Nokia, one team tried to revamp Symbian, the aging operating system that most Nokia phones ran, and another effort, eventually dubbed Migo, tried to build a new system from the ground up. People involved in both efforts say that the two teams competed with each other for support within the company and attention from the top executives. It was a problem that plagued Nokia's R&D operations. As the saying goes, anything that's divided internally will never succeed. As Alyssa the Curtis, Nokia's chief designer from 2006 to 2009 put it, you are spending more time fighting internal politics than doing design. Key business partners were also frustrated as well. The chief executive of chip manufacturer Qualcomm, Paul Jacobs, started working with Nokia in 2008. His main complaint was that Nokia really took too much time when working on strategies. This is a quote from Mr. Jacobs. We will present to Nokia a new technology that to us would seem a big opportunity. But instead of diving into this opportunity, Nokia would spend a long time, maybe six to nine months, assessing the opportunity. And by this time, the opportunity just often went away. The real problem was that Nokia's management just couldn't steer the huge multinational company quickly enough. They seemed to just keep throwing money at the problem instead of innovating through it with wisdom. Even jumping over to Android seemed like a short-term solution, a shortcut. Nokia's smartphone division management, Asi Van Jockey, dismissed the idea of Android as peeing in your pants for warmth in the winter. Ouch. In 2010, Canadian Stephen Elop took over the helm. A bit of his history first. So, new CEO. It's like the third CEO in about five years. Uh, the last part was about the R&D teams fighting uh, each other instead of trying to come up with a plan, being too slow. Take advantage of opportunity because they were too conservative. Even though they were throwing money at multiple hardware models, they were too conservative. 
about making decisions when it had uh, software implications. In 2005, he worked for Macromedia, which got bought by Adobe during his time as CEO. And from 2008 to 2010, he worked for Microsoft, working on Microsoft Office products. At the time of Evox's arrival, Nokia was spending $5 billion on research and development. That's 30% of the entire mobile industry's total. Yet, it remained far from launching a legitimate competitor to the iPhone. However, Nokia didn't lose the N8 and N900. Both good attempts, but it was still clear that Nokia was struggling to focus on useful R&D. Mr. Evox had had enough. He sifted through data and visited labs around the world to personally terminate projects that weren't core priorities. As it turns out, the organizational structure of Nokia was also extremely convoluted. In 2010, for instance, Nokia was hashing out some details of software that would make it easier for outside programmers to write applications that could work on any Nokia smartphone. At some companies, such decisions might be made around a conference table. But in Nokia's case, it was a nightmare. According to some inside attendees of the meeting, this is how it went down. 100 engineers and product managers from different offices as far as Massachusetts and China were all called into a hotel venue in Germany. Over three days, Nokia employees sat down and jotted notes. Meanwhile, representatives of Mego, Symbian and other operating systems within Nokia all struggled to make themselves heard. As one person recalls, people were just trying to keep their jobs. Each group was accountable for delivering the most competitive phone. As you can see from the situation, it was pretty much cutthroat, dog eat dog, not a good environment. However, out of these meetings, two OS's emerged. A new version of Symbian, a successor to the old Symbian OS, and Migo, a promising software that finally arrived with the Nokia N9. Although Migo was a pretty good attempt and was a great step in the right direction, it was too little too late. The App Store was severely undeveloped at a time when Apple and Google's App Stores were rocket shipping off. Unfortunately, so there you go. Uh, so that the, the, the main thing, that was the main, main thing. They got hit sideways, still focusing on hardware, when the whole, you know, you can look at, they, they looked at the iPhone like, um, oh, look how simple it is. It's got no flavor, it's got no style. But that was the point. It wasn't so much that you define yourself by your hardware or your, you know, the style of your phone, is that your, the way that you arrange your operating system is how you're going to, how your phone is uh, unique for yourself. So Apple went, you know, they made it very easy for developers to put apps on the app store. So the library of apps grew very quickly. They didn't try to control the apps. Uh, they let, like I said, outside developers develop apps, whereas Nokia was really involved in the whole process of the, of the apps, right? They, 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 they had to, you know, they wanted to control them. They didn't have a system. Then Android figured that out too. Android also figured out they had to make some kind of format that outside, uh, that, that could allow outside developers to make apps as well. So at that point, Nokia came up with this new Symbian system, but it was way too late, way, way too late. And, uh, you know, Nokia's were already getting, you know, they were kind of a, you know, old, old person's phone at that point. It was all fruitless, as the Mega operating system was discontinued in 2012. So, Microsoft tries to make a deal. Here we go, we still have Nokia, a big company, they can make phones, a lot of yada yada. Microsoft is not really a player, so far it's like Android, Google, and Apple, and Microsoft wants to give it a try. So why not join with Nokia? In February 2011, Stephen Elock and Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer jointly announced a major partnership between Nokia and Microsoft which would see Nokia adopt Windows Phone as its primary platform of future smartphones, replacing both Symbian and Neo. Nokia unveiled the first Windows Phone 7 devices on October 26 in 2011. They were the Lumia 710 and Lumia 800, which was quickly followed by the Lumia 900. In April 2012, while Nokia's internal divisions were squabbling, Samsung overtook Nokia as the largest phone manufacturer in the world. In 2013, Nokia introduced the 925, which is a slimmed down version of the 920, also incorporating an aluminium design. After this, Nokia went on to release the Lumia 1020. This phone was all about the camera, a 41 megapixel shooter with a Symbian based 808 pure view technology. 
The phone did receive critical acclaim for its camera and general design and performance. Unfortunately, there was still the problem of apps. You see, the Windows marketplace using Windows Phone devices wasn't exactly that vibrant. Quality app developers were slow to get on board the platform, and this ultimately hurt Nokia. Although the Lumia series was doing better than BlackBerry, Nokia still made an operating loss of 115 million euros, with revenues falling 24% during the second quarter of 2013. But looking at the bigger picture, it's even worse. Since 2011, Nokia sustained 4.1 billion euros worth of operating losses. By this stage, the game was pretty much over, the ship was sinking, and the Windows platform wasn't providing much of a lifeboat. Nokia as a company was under a bit of pressure. And it's a beautiful device yeah, okay. that uh, is making its appearance in yeah. for the first time as this as this show airs. Okay. 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 But as for future products, uh, my twenty eight twenty is coming out. I'll say a couple things about future products. I can do one thing. I have an iPhone. Oh, how embarrassing! I, I don't want to have an iPhone. I want to. I want to. I want to take care of that for you. Yeah. Right here. There we go. I want to have a Nokia phone. It's gone. I want to have a Nokia phone. Because I believe in you and I believe in Nokia, yes. but I want to have that Lumia 9 too late. When do I get it? So let me tell you what we're doing in the future. <laughs> Can we before that? <laughs> I will not. I'm not sorry, I can't answer. Okay. Let me give you some advice. Let me give you some advice. The process of doing a second. On the 3rd of September, 2013. Microsoft announced that it would acquire Nokia's mobile phone division in a deal totaling 7 billion US dollars. Stephen Elock would also step down as Nokia's CEO and rejoin Microsoft as the head of devices. CEO 4. But the question is, was this a conflict of interest for Elock? Was there a dark side behind this move? As it turns out, this sadly may have been the case. It is reported that Elock got an 18.8 million euro bonus after he sold Nokia to Microsoft and stepped down as CEO. What's more is that this agreement was only made on the same day as the announcement. Was Elock's shaky CEO position in Nokia just a part of Microsoft's plan to enter the smartphone game all along? We may never know for sure. In October 2014, the burial had begun. Microsoft officially announced that it would phase out the Nokia brand in its promotion of the Lumia smartphones. It would now be known as Microsoft Lumia. And this sadly was the end of Nokia's brand. Maybe in some distant time, in some throwback, nostalgic way, they could come back. But right now, this really does look like the end of the trail for an absolutely amazing company. So, throughout history, we've seen the same thing over and over again. Like Palm with WebOS, or Intel with mobile internet devices, or even Xerox with a graphical user interface. It's been repeatedly demonstrated that being the first to a good idea is no guarantee of commercial success. So, yeah. Being first to a good idea is no guarantee of commercial success. I think that is pretty fair to say. Being first, that's what I was saying before. If you're first, it doesn't mean that you're going to be the one that gets the timing right, that can capture the imagination of the customer, make them understand the benefits that you see. You might see a revolution, but they're, you know, if they have no way to apply that revolution to their lives, it's going to be difficult for them to see it. They might see it. But by that time, you're going to have competition. So, uh, Nokia, you can still buy old Nokia phones, I think. I don't know if they make new models. I think they don't. I think that's what they were saying at the end. They became this Microsoft brand, Microsoft Lumia. <clears throat> All right, so uh, if you have your books, I'm going to start on page 59 and wrap up this chapter. Uh, hopefully this will trigger you to be able to finish your task. I'm getting questions about cost a lot. Um, in the last video, I think I was very clear about the story of cost. Um, cost is not you're not writing a business plan. You're showing that you understand the market that you're entering. 
So you're supposed to talk about the differences in that market, which includes differences in costs, to, you know, whether it's bribes on a really basic level, uh, distribution costs, uh, mostly not, not too much production costs. If you're producing your product in Australia, I mean, you might might come up with a strategy where you realize or you think that you ought to produce it in Vietnam. But that's more of a long-term strategy when you're talking about general savings. I'm not asking you to do calculations. I'm asking you to analyze where you think costs can come into play in this market. And for whatever innovation you want to add, to that. So the innovation that you add is going to cost money, whether it's product. Um, I mean, you could theoretically believe that you could standardize your entire marketing approach for this market, but you'd still have to explain why it's similar. You'd have to explain why there's no difference between the markets. So, <clears throat> which leads us on page 59 at marketing strategy. Um, one more paragraph about costs. One way to assess an innovation is in terms of net cash flow. Earn versus burn. The difference between the income from an innovation earned and the money spent to make it happen. So that also, uh, I think that was a point that I made in the last video too, is that at a certain point, Nokia they just kept throwing money at things that were not working, even though they were way behind. And um, it's called bad money, or good money chasing after bad. Bad money is money that's going into an idea that's not going to succeed. And to try to force it to succeed when it's not succeeding is the good money being chased, is chasing after it. Um, so knowing when to stop is also a huge part of research and development, knowing when an idea is not going to work, that it's too late, or the timing is wrong, or there's no marketing strategy, the customer won't understand it, it's too early. So here we are, marketing strategy. To successfully <clears throat> commercialize an innovation, commercialize, not to innovate, to commercialize it, not to create it, not to develop it. Commercialize means get it into the market. A company must align its production and marketing strategies. Uh, as we saw with Nokia here, their R&D department, they had two different R&D departments competing with each other, which led to a lot of problems, and they were also very slow to analyze the new technology that was coming up and take advantage of it. So they were not able to align their production and marketing strategies. They, the strategies were developing too slowly, a radical change may require an education campaign to build understanding about the need for the innovation and the benefits it will bring to consumers. Nowhere did I see with the executives of Nokia at this time uh, a vision of the future that was, you know, the guy, the one guy is like, you know, uh, you know, both sides. The guy's like, well, where can I get something like this right now? And the guy's like, well, it's not ready yet. And then at the other time, it's like, well, what is your vision for the future? It's like something that competes with the products today. That's not a very big future vision. So they probably needed to change the whole mindset of the company. And the company was spread out in different countries and different places as well. So they should have been on this about 2005 or six. Way too late. Too much commitment to the Symbian system. Too much belief in uh, the 3G network at that time versus the App Store. Too much reliance on hardware or software. Marketing strategy, and that's what the consumer wanted. The consumer wanted more games, more fun, you know. They even knew because they you, they had that, you know, what was the most popular game they mentioned in the last video, that stupid snake game. So snake, wow, okay, take a clue, right? You know, people are already using Game Boys by 2000, 2001, 2002. Uh, and 
gauge system came in 2002, but they tried to turn the game system into a telephone, so that didn't work to mix those two things. It was kind of too ambitious. Maybe have your phone be your phone and your game be your game. Um, so they, they just kept missing it over and over again. The iPhone was good for games and it was also good for everything else. Photography, they, they had the camera, it had everything. Marketing strategy may need a range of approaches, including public relations, which was a failure there. Advertising, they kept the same advertising, uh, connecting people instead of like kind of empowering your life. The Apple iPhone was all about your empowerment of your life, not about connecting people. Uh, and changes to packaging and promotion within distribution networks. These will build awareness, interest, and desire for the innovation. Early Apple campaigns, pretty ambitious. Wholesalers and retailers were need, will need to be educated so they can sell the features and benefits to the consumer to help generate demand. In this case, we're, you know, it depends on your uh, pool or push promotion strategy. If you were an iPhone as the international brand that's popular in the United States in 2008, people who heard about it or saw the advertisements in 2008 in Vietnam, they wanted to have that product. So obviously that was a cool situation. So in that case, the wholesalers and retailers will want to be supplying that product already. But for other products that are too similar, very similar, maybe slightly innovative, but not very clear how, or luxury goods, or a market where wholesalers and retailers are unsure about whether there will be demand for that product, then support is needed in that market in order to get the distribution the distributors to support you. You have to work with them and educate them about how, all the way to the retail level, about how they can interest customers in this new product. So, wholesalers and retailers will need to be educated so that they can sell the features and benefits to the consumer and push uh, and try to generate demand. Positioning huge part of marketing strategy now in the most basic level we remember positioning is something where value which is connected to product features benefits and price come together it's the, that's the, there's other kinds of positioning there's positioning based on convenience there's positioning based on you could use uh, different uh, depending on what are the, the main features and benefits of a product you can have a positioning that's relative um, you can have a car and you can have gas mileage versus uh, safety or performance. You can create different kinds of positioning, but the most common form is price and quality. And that's customer perception. That's not, you know, you might think you're better quality, but it depends on what the customer perceives really. And positioning may also have a huge impact on the success of this innovation. What was the positioning of Nokia? Nokia was positioned as the mass market go-to mobile phone. Uh, were they ever able to push through that? Apple at the time, the demand for Apple was just very, uh, it was driven by people who wanted to be early adopters. It was driven by people who wanted to show off the latest technology and it had a little luxury element to it, um, had a little futuristic kind of element to it, and it was uh, super convenient. Um, I don't want to say convenient, let's say uh, their interface was extremely easy to use. So you didn't have to be a techie, you didn't have to have any special you didn't have to know anything about tech to use it well. Um, okay, so positioning may also have an impact on the success of innovations. If a company has built an image and reputation for being innovative and high quality, 
consumers, wholesalers, and retailers will also already feel that and they'll be pulled. So they are more likely to believe the claims about the new and improved products and services. So you develop a reputation. The one other thing this video talked about was Samsung. Uh, Samsung was able, I believe, to well, they jumped on the Android, right? So that was their that was their entrance into the market, right? So they jumped into the Android system. So they had the benefits of Apple. But they also had, you know, they, they, they were they were cheaper. So they were like a little cheaper version. And now they're similar, you know. So. Uh, but they were cheaper than an Apple, and you could get them easier. At certain points, getting an iPhone was difficult and expensive. Um, so Samsung was pretty smart uh, to be able to get into the early game, and they uh, really jumped through, they jumped through. The 3G, so then they finally came up with iPhone 3 to 3G. <clears throat> What's the earliest one? Which, uh, <clears throat> I'm 
So, in terms of your project, um, you're, you know, unlike last year, okay, in our marketing plan last year, we were trying to choose a niche market in a local uh, economy where we had uh, what we would call a level playing field and each company, it was a, you know, it was a market that was, uh, competition was free, everybody had access to the same suppliers, same media advertising, the same labor market, so costs couldn't be really considered in that marketing plan. I did that on purpose. I wanted you to focus on other kinds of competitive advantages. Is there cost advantages? In this case, there may be. Um, but it's, uh, you'd have to justify it, you really would. So there's possible different uh, marketing strategies with price that would maybe give you a competitive advantage. Product is a big one, and understanding your target market, who you'd want to target in this market, is probably the number one. Although, creative distribution and possible alliances with other companies in the market or distributors might be a way to, um, or you know, to find if there's an up and coming way to sell that people are getting involved in. I don't know, Shopee or something. I don't know what are the popular online retailers right now. But if you find one that you can say, hey, look, this is the new up and coming one, or shippers or whatever, then you might have an advantage there. Uh, promotion. You know, some kind of adaptation strategy that's uh, especially for Vietnam that can show and highlight the benefits and features that your product delivers that is, are not available at this time in the local market. <coughs> or perhaps a promotional campaign that's directed at the positioning that you're trying for. So you're showing that you get some kind of, you're justifying or trying, trying to create in the customer that perception of your positioning that you want them to feel about you. So those are the marketing strategies. Uh, it may have to do with people and training. Starbucks actually, I think they really have a competitive advantage with their training system. Um, even though their brand is a pool brand, people want to go check it out because it's an American brand, yada, yada, yada. Once you go to Starbucks, in most, you know, or once you try most products, in order to become a loyal customer, you have to get something more than just the first attraction to a product. So I think that the customer service at Starbucks is so good that they're able to take the pool promotion and then treat, uh, create loyal customers from that. Okay, technology, and that's what we're talking about here. So one of the complaints about the early iPhone, and I didn't, I had number one, it was, uh, it was fine, I wasn't too demanding, but some people maybe were, was that uh, they could uh, come out with this 2G, uh, this faster phone, and move it to a 3G and make it faster. That was always kind of a thing. Every time they upgraded the phone, they would always say it's faster, it's faster, it's faster. Um, in this case, though, I think you could, I don't know, I don't remember, it's too long ago, but uh, I guess there was some pressure for them, but I would imagine that they actually did that on purpose, that they put out the 2G version because it functioned with their software, which wasn't very fast, so it kind of like, it, it worked together well, and then once they figured out the technology of how their app store and software work, they could deal with a faster system. Um, but I'm going to give a couple more examples of how technology may uh, affect whether or not the market is ready for a product or whether or not an innovation will work. So I'm on page 59 at the bottom of the page. Looking at technology. Technological discovery or invention can provide a stimulus for innovation. And that's what Nokia missed. They just didn't catch it. A new technology may enable a company to do something they could not do and give them the platform to change their business. And I think I mentioned that before about the cloud services now, uh, the 
you can use to, for app developers that really makes it cost efficient to be, to fo you can focus on your core business, which is creation of an app, not getting funding to support the servers that you need to support the demand that may or may not come for your app. So it allows you to really, you know, keep your operations small. So anyway, uh, technological discovery or invention can provide a stimulus for innovation. A new technology may enable a company to do something they could not and give them the platform to change the business. An example is the way that secure online payment systems and a stable internet, uh, secure and stable, allows companies to change to digital distribution of products and services. So, I don't think you could probably come up with a bigger example than Netflix. <clears throat> so, uh, there should be like a little story. Is there a brief story of Netflix? Netflix was not an online business at first. Netflix was in competition with the video stores, the video DVD stores. And <clears throat> uh, what they did was they, so, okay, your choices at that time were to buy DVDs from the DVD store, which people, you know, how much, you know, it's not like music, you don't watch a movie so many times, I don't. Uh, I don't think that many people, I don't think very many people listen to, the music is more replayable, put it that way, rewatchable or replayable. Um, so what people would do is they'd go to video stores to rent DVDs. So you would have a membership and you'd have to pay per rental. It would be cheaper than the cinema price, obviously. And you have like three or four or five days to to uh, be able to uh, watch it and then bring it back to the DVD store or video store and add video cassettes too. So uh, the video cassette industry went to the DVD industry. Netflix came on the scene when it was like DVD rentals. What Netflix would do is that they were able to Netflix, they had it figured out that 
It took this many rentals in order to in order to uh, to make their money back, and they had good deals with the movie studios directly, so they would get the movies directly from the studios. So they were, you know, people still wanted to go and browse and look in the DVD store. So that was Blockbuster. They were the market leader for that. Um, but Netflix did very well for people who were busy, not near a DVD store. And uh, yeah, it was a shared market share. Then they went online. Of course, uh, that was an obvious move eventually. Uh, Blockbuster could have, they probably could have been the first one to go online. They could have seen that opportunity and said, okay, great. We've got all these videos anyway. We've got money. We've got profit to, we can turn in to invest. We have the connections with the movie studios. We're all set up to go. We should be able to stream online. But Netflix was quicker. They were much quicker. And uh, at the end of a certain point they were they, they picked their time right they picked their time right so that was uh, that was really that was really uh, part of their luck right the internet as you know I don't know how young you were when you first started using the internet but um, up until a certain point, it wasn't always easy to stream things online. We had uh, internet connections that were not great, and it wasn't <clears throat> something that you wanted to do is to try to watch videos if you can't, you know, if they're not streaming correctly. So my internet has been terrible lately. I feel like it's 2009 again. But in the US and in many markets, they already had high-speed internet that was working quite well. So uh, Netflix uh, wasn't going to enter, you know, so they started in those markets. And you know that we've only got Netflix for like two or three years now. And uh, we had to get our internet up to a certain level. But also they did research and development in the background of, a buffer so there's buffering there's the way that the video streams that it saves a certain amount of content when it's streaming so in case the internet goes up and down you still watch it continuously until the internet comes back online and that really helps your experience so they worked on the technology on the back end to make sure that the experience for the viewer was going to be positive you didn't want to have, they didn't want to open up in markets and then have everybody complain that they, that they couldn't watch the movies. So uh, Netflix had minimum technological requirements for each system or each country that was uh, using the Netflix system. So they had to be uh, very careful, but also develop their own technology to make sure the streaming worked well. So. The technology was really connected with the expansion. Now, this is true for sports too. If you have, I mean, I have, I only, you know, I have my three things that I buy every month. I have my Netflix, I have my NBA uh, basketball, which is useless now. It's not totally useless. I can watch old games, but um, it's, uh, it's not as exciting as it was. And Spotify, which I find is fairly reasonable price. <coughs> Here too, but all of those depend on uh, good buffering and uh, steady internet connections. So that's that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the how, how the how the technology of the new market will support a business as it enters the market. So that also goes according to payment systems. Um, the security of the banks in the country uh, and stable internet as it says here and now we have cable television how is cable television which is getting weaker and weaker how is te cable television uh, killing traditional TV we live in strange times 
Uh, maybe you're watching some of your, or meeting some of your teachers directly in the Zoom. Is this the best we can do? Is Zoom going to be a short-term trend? Is there something that we should have uh, used that might be more useful or better? So we're going to find out, you know, I think it's a question that you should critique the Zoom as you use it and think, okay, what works and what doesn't work in the Zoom system? Because uh, I have my criticisms, you know, I teach with it in the IELTS class and it's very difficult, but it's the only way I can do it. People have their cameras switched off. I can't really do anything with that. Um, some, some placement of the pieces that you use when you share screen are poorly placed. Uh, when you want to have a list of students on the, you know, on the screen while the teacher is on the, you know, you're sharing some screen. So, you know, if I was going to show a video on the screen and you can watch the video and I can see your faces and you have a strip of students over here. Uh, funny, two problems. One is Vietnamese. We're talk about adaptation. <clears throat> if the people don't have their cameras on, it says the name of the person and instead of saying it like, uh, you know, my name, Keith Kirshner, then uh, I would see my name first and then my second name would get cut off. Instead of that, I see your family name and then the Vietnamese name that you're called by gets cut off. So I can't call people by name based on that list. <clears throat> it's a nightmare. I have to have two lists. I have to write down a whole list and then I have to look at the middle and family names and try to figure out which name is the person I should call on to answer a question. Also, that list of students, it keeps jumping around. So if I want to go and just go and follow the list and say, okay, person A, answer question one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh yeah, well you already did number two already, sorry. I'm sorry, who else is not, I can't, I can't just go down the list and follow down the list. It's very tricky. Uh, sometimes when you come back from, uh, you have this thing called breakout rooms where you put students into a room to do some activity together in groups. When you come back, the microphone is turned off every time and I never remember. And it's like, somebody says, teacher, your microphone's off every time. <laughs> because you're trying to do 10 things and you're trying to keep focused on the lesson and the microphone turns off automatically. So anyway. <clears throat> That's uh, part of the evolution of what they're trying to do with teaching online. And I guess we'll find out if Zoom is gonna adapt, if they're really the best one, or some competitor is gonna come blasting through with a better system. So, uh, in terms of your company, your management needs to be able to figure out and manage and analyze information, keep an open mind about competitors. Even if you're the market leader, you have to really be careful about what's coming up behind you. If anything, uh, you know, you, you probably should adapt to changes even if you're, you know, you're ahead of everyone else in terms of market share. Market research, understanding customers, looking for trends and opportunities. Uh, Nokia had two, Nokia had two R&D departments. It totally messed up their ability to generate ideas. It made them very competitive in a bad way. <clears throat> and that was a management failure. So, meetings, trying to have a supportive, creative workplace and to learn from mistakes and to be able to quickly identify the options that are available and make decisions. Realize ideas to be able to have the production capacity and to be able to um, get things actually into the market, to be able to turn an idea into a concept, into reality, to drive the processes and keep people focused and within budget. I'm sure Steve Jobs would just come into the R&D meeting and tell everyone, okay, uh, I want a phone that can fly. See you guys in three days. And just left his research people to like try to figure out how to make a phone fly to its owner like a boomerang. Uh, you know, he'd wake up from a dream and just tell people what he wanted and then rely on uh, the R&D department to be creative and find a solution to the problem. <clears throat> and
And then you get to the technological aspects that uh, become proprietary, in other words, your intellectual property. So, protecting the technology in a new market is going to be very difficult, especially a market that has weak intellectual property protection, like China, for example. So, part of your task is to be able to understand the IP, not only the technological issues, but the IP separate and how that can be affected. So, don't forget, you have um, your logo, your brand, your trademark. So, you have um, that is uh, copyright, copyright of anything that's creative. You have trademarks, copyrights, patents, designs. Um, so it's up to you to figure out a little bit and to do some research on Vietnamese intellectual property. A company is more likely to benefit from an innovation if they can prevent competitors from using it too. An innovative product design, manufacturing technology, or improvements made to features or packaging. Packaging can also be uh, protected by IP may result in increased sales and you want to keep your differences. A new market or increased profits through lower costs. So, an innovative product design, uh, a new market or increased profit through lower costs. That's incremental innovation, actually. Protecting a design through a patent, copyright, or registered design will stop competitors from making and launching their own versions and benefiting from the time and money another company invested in innovation. So don't just forget, you know, don't forget that besides the law, there's the enforcement of the law, and a question of whether the government will actually, does it actually, have there been any cases of intellectual property law being applied in Vietnam? There has to be something. So see if you can find some case that may have been successful and you can understand the limits of what you can protect in Vietnam. All right, last thing today, we have this uh, little case study here. Lego, Lego was not always riding high. Lego was getting a little bit weak in the 1990s. Lego had been in decline in sales since the 1990s. To turn it around, they invested heavily in innovation to try to create a range of new products including virtual Lego toys that you can put online uh, that moved away from their core business of construction. One of those experiments was uh, something called Galador. Galador. Galador is amazing. It was a buildable action figure and also a hugely expensive failure. Galador had electronics in it that you could play games with and a company video game and a TV show. Now, some people, they are, you know, that happened. Uh, wow, what was the one my son used? It was called Star Sun something. Wow, I, the game was very weird. Star, something Landers, something Star Landers, Zoo Landers. Um, but anyway, you had magnetic pieces and they would somehow fit into the gameplay and you could put them into uh, some adventures or something. And there was hundreds of characters. It was like Pokemon. There was just like too many characters, right? What, Pokemon seemed like a fun game to me until it just seemed like a big scam. Um, but, you know, my son likes it somehow, so I don't know, it's, like, every explanation he gives me makes no sense. But, uh, Galador, yeah, Galador, you'll, you'll love Galador, Galador is the bestest. <clears throat> Galador. Galador, you're gonna love Galador. Wait till you see Galador. Every dimension needs a hero.
every hero needs a special power. In Yandor, he's ancient. God, or every, what is it, every dimension needs a hero. It's amazing. <clears throat> God, or every dimension needs a hero. Every hero needs a special power. In Yandor, he's ancient. You can glitch to change form. Glitch to combine powers. Glitch to save Galador from Thor. It's a power like nothing in. Dude, that's amazing! You can glitch to get Galador and save Galador from Gore. Look at all these things that he's got. Like, he's got, why would his lizard legs help him to be so? I don't even know. Why can he jump? I don't know. It's Galador. Look at his head. You can just like replace all his arms and legs. Actually, this might actually work now, but at the time it was extremely goofy. Oh my god, you know, every dimension, you gotta watch the whole thing again. Come on, every dimension needs a hero. Every dimension needs a hero. Every hero needs a special power. In Yandor, he's ancient. You can glitch to change form. Glitch to combine powers. Glitch to save Yalador from Thor. It's a power like nothing in this dimension, Yalador. Each soul separately. Defenders! What was it called? Defenders of... Come on, here. What are you doing? Defenders of the Outer Dimension. Woo! Galador. <clears throat> but Lego survived somehow, even despite Galador. So Lego, um, <clears throat> interesting story, Lego had a patent, right? So the patent expired. Patents don't last forever, so you and me, right now, we could go make a factory and make things that look exactly like Legos, and we could sell them. And Lego can't do anything. If we don't put the logo of the Lego on the top of the Lego, then there's nothing they can do. So surprisingly, when you go to those uh, toy stores in Vietnam, I mean, you probably think, okay, well, this is all copied. Some of it is, of course, but some of it is actually different companies who just use the fact that the patent for Lego is over, and uh, they made their own designs. I don't know if that's city companies like that. But it's like, you know, Chinese-style kind of production, and they just put stuff on a design into a 3D printer and <laughs> make a bunch of Lego stuff. So, some of that is actually legal. You would think that it's all illegal, but some of it isn't. The stuff that's illegal and the way that Lego was able to reinvent themselves was to put themselves together with uh, Pixar Studios, and of course the Marvel Cinematic Universe, <coughs> MCU, <coughs> Marvel Cinematic Universe, <coughs> and get involved in all these superhero things. So even though Lego's rights to its blocks are not really different, <coughs> the actual Lego, the, the cross promotion with all of those brands and movies is protected by copyright. So that's protected by, yeah, by copyright now. They're not protected by patents, they're protected by copyrights. So Lego decided that their best move was to go and try to join forces with uh, all these characters and to cross-promote movies and to uh, build relationships with kids through all the cinema and animation and Frozen and all the things from Pixar too. So, smart move. Smart move from Lego. Now Lego is big again and relevant, so they were able to reinvent themselves. But in the middle, this Galador was awful. <clears throat> but maybe ahead of its time. Uh, Lego did what you're supposed to do when facing a challenge. Think outside the box. They changed the way they did business. Started marketing strategies they had no expertise in and launched some standalone products very different to what they had sold. Some innovations were successful, though, because they did get together with uh, Harry Potter 
and Star Wars themed Legos, but the cost of the unsuccessful innovations almost led to disaster. And now, even now, technique is uh, coming back and a lot of schools are using technique, Lego technique, to show, uh, you know, they're becoming educational toys. So, <clears throat> here's to Lego's reinvention. I think they did a good job at reinventing themselves. Um, the technique, I see it now at my, my uh, son's school. We use it a lot. And it gotten pretty crazy, and you can look, you know, some, you know, it's fun to see how things work. People don't have so much chance to to uh, open up now. Still, now here we go. We got technique mixed with Fast and Furious. We've got all of the different cross promotions. Uh, you can really get involved in making a crane and understanding how the the, the physics of the crane work. And some people who would normally get involved in like some kind of building or electronics can uh, really enjoy this kind of thing. So, and some of it they have speed tests now. <coughs> Top Gear, wow, there's another cross promotion. So now you're cross promoting with a British TV show, a car brand, uh, and, uh, and the Legos. So it's, it's going five different ways. So, Lego is definitely back. They really were able to reinvent themselves in a very interesting way. So, uh, again, good job, Legos. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later. Innovation.